say. I think you're going to find that, although we're going to speak very differently, that if you think carefully about what we're saying, uh, there's a great deal of interdigitation going on here. I'm gonna, can I take this out of here and walk around? Yes, I can. I was looking for something to kind of put an umbrella over my remarks, and it just occurred to me uh, this phrase from the American poet, W.H. Auden, and he wrote, we are lived by forces we scarcely understand. And I think that's a really good summary for me of why it is nothing's working in the world today, including the world of economics. I come at this as an ecologist. I'm probably one of a few in the room, not as an economist. And what ecology, to me, brings to this discipline is a sense of human evolutionary history. So I would make two points uh, to start my talk in the framing that Auden has given us. The first is that if you understand where I'm coming from, you will accept this readily. If you don't, you'll reject it out of hand. Here's the first point then. The Anthropocene, this era in which humans have come to dominate the planet, is an inevitable outcome of human evolutionary processes. It's an emergent phenomenon of a biological system in which human beings happen to be somewhat unique. Now, it's exceptionalism, but in a different dimension from the one that we normally take as true. With an ecological, or rather an economic understanding that is a completely erratic map of the reality it, it purports to represent. Ecological economics is a different map. Now, the point is it's not a perfect map, but it may be a little bit better. And human understanding proceeds by making progress of whatever reality it is that that individual or group are working on. So we are all engaged here in a struggle better to represent our relationship to the natural world through the major discipline in which we manifest that relationship, which is economics. It's material science in the social science domain. Now, in order to do that properly, we have to understand human evolutionary origins. I, I said we are an evolved species. The anthro Anthropocene is an inevitable outcome of the nature of the human evolutionary process. And here is, I believe, why. First of all, as an evolved species, we share two properties with every other species on the planet. Now, these are predispositions. They won't be held by everyone, but they are characteristic of every species. The first is that we will, as a species, expand to fill all the available habitat. We will expand to fill all the available habitat. We are the most widespread species on the planet because we do it better than any other species because of our technological capacity. The second thing that we will do, as every other species will do, is to use up all the available resources. Now the advantage that we have over other species is technology, because what technology does is constantly define what is available. So if you look at the oil and gas sector, 10 years ago we were talking about peak oil, and oil shale was always going to be the energy of the future. Now it's the energy of the present because we got the technology to get at it. But as Charlie has emphasized over and over again, energy is the means by which human beings appropriate all the other resources on the planet. And therefore, when we found out how to use fossil fuel in the middle part of the 19th century in great abundance, the human system was poised to take off. So it's an evolutionary phenomenon because human beings have high intelligence and evolved property, which gives us access to the technological means by which to exploit available energy supplies and use them all up and using, all up, using up all the other resources on the planet. The trouble is, none of us understand that that's what's going on. It's very difficult to put brakes on something if you don't even understand the origins of what's driving the whole system forward. This is fundamental biological evolution. We are an extraordinarily successful species in the basic Darwinian sense of spreading over the planet 
and appropriating all the resources available unto ourselves. There's a basic physics principle that uh, Charlie's been engaged in, in trying to get here. And that is the maximum power principle, stated back in the 20s by an ecologist who argued that successful systems in nature are those systems that manage to appropriate the maximum amount of energy from their environments and use it efficiently to propagate themselves. Well, there is the definition of human evolutionary uh, success, and we have to understand that that's what's going on here. Now, there's another problem in that while we have that natural expansionist tendency, which also tends to use up all resources, we have socially constructed a worldview, we've heard that term over and over again here, which not does not counter that tendency, but reinforces it. Growth-based neoliberal economics is a social construct which builds upon the momentum of human evolutionary reality. And hence, we're in the worst of all possible worlds, and it gets worse. Okay. So we have an economic model that promotes infinite growth, and by the way, we have the twin myths of unlimited technological process propelling economic growth. It's both a description of our history and in fact an accurate way of understanding how it is that we've got to the dilemma that we have because we're uh, growing within this finite space as, as Peter has pointed out. Now there's yet another dimension. This is why this is really such a transdisciplinary idea. And this one comes to us from hum human cognitive psychology. You know, this may offend some of you, but we had this meeting 20 years ago. Right? The same concepts, the same principles, the same ideas, the same enemies, the same saviors are all up on the line in our slides and so on and so forth. We aren't moving forward in any substantive way. The mainstream seems entrenched. The neoliberal paradigm, if anything, has in fact become more entrenched in the last 40 years because of a deliberate undertaking by the extreme right, the corporate right, and particularly in North America, to reframe the entire political dialogue in the grossest corporate terms that currently dominate political discourse in, in North America. Well, why is that important? How many of you are familiar with the book, uh, Don't Talk of an Elephant, in, in its new version? Well, he's really nailed it, but the point of the matter is what cognitive psychology tells us, or cognitive neuroscience really, is that if an idea is repeated frequently enough, if people are exposed to the same way of thinking frequently enough, it literally helps to shape the synaptic circuits of the brain. So that once we have had to have 40 years of the promulgation of the corporate worldview, of the growthist mentality, and so on and so forth, everything else tends to fall by the wayside. You don't hear we're having a federal election in this country right now, and it's all about what can we do to stimulate growth. Nobody talks about the possibility of redistribution or, or changing the tax system. Nobody talks about the public interest anymore. It's all about what's good for the corporate sector, the economy, or whatever. So the dialogue has shifted. And we're so caught up in that uh, prescribed dialogue that nobody even effectively challenges it in, in the mainstream media. So we are in a trap because of human cognitive reality. And the reality is that it was highly adaptive for a culture, for people growing up in a particular culture, to acquire the beliefs, the values, the assumptions, and the mythology of their tribe. Because that's what gives social identity, that's what is what gives social cohesion and a sense of self and purpose within the in-group. Right? So we are trapped in an adaptive process that is cognitively reinforced by the literal creation of synaptic circuits in the brain that keeps repeating and reinforcing that particular way of thinking. Now this is not to say it can't be broken. But to break it, you have to recognize it's there. It's like a, an alcoholic having to recognize that he has a real or she has a real problem and take whatever steps are necessary to break from that model. This is what, really what Peter was talking about when he talked about the great unbounding. We need to unbind ourselves from our current way of thinking 
through an explicit recognition of what it is that has got us trapped in this way of thinking because it is so profoundly ill-constructed relative to the context within which we find ourselves, okay? So there's an enormous problem of the cognitive blockage, and it shows up over and over and over again in previous cultures. How many of you are familiar with the book The Collapse of Complex Societies? All right. Well, what <clears throat> Joseph Painter shows there is that human societies tend to go through a cyclical uh, form of development, uh, growth, uh, they emerge as great artistic and military powers and all of that, but then they regenify. They become corrupt at the top. The people become disillusioned. They haven't any longer got the resources to manage the next problem. There's diminishing returns throughout the... And then the whole system implodes upon itself. In biology, there's an emergent theory called panarchy theory, where we see these repeating cycles over and over and over again, including, it's a perfect description, frankly, of Tainter's version of, of the collapse of complex societies, although the two have never really come together. So it seems to me we have to understand that our culture has gone through and is going through on a repeated basis this cycle. We start out optimistic, full of vim and vigor, novel ideas and creativity. We start to grow and this tends to get bureaucratized, rigidified and so on and so forth. You reach the point though where a corruption sets in, there becomes an increasing gap between rich and poor. All of the characteristics that we see occurring in Western democratic capitalist countries uh, today are manifest in this cyclical model. There is no way out of this if we don't consciously recognize where we are. The solution to this requires understanding what can we do to suspend ourselves at a desirable point in the cycle so that we don't move beyond the point of collapse because that is the ultimate state of the system. It implodes on itself from diminishing returns, corruption, loss of confidence in governance and so on and so forth. Half the Canadian population will not vote Oste not ostensibly, because the surveys tell us they're just totally disillusioned with our leadership and so on and so forth. It's worse in the States. Anyway, I think we've got a huge problem here. You may have gathered that by now. And it requires a profound understanding, not only of the human ecology, the human behavior ecology that brings us here, but of the various social constructs out of which we operate daily, which bear no relation to the reality in which they are trying to uh, make us uh, operate. And if you think about, you know, so, and many of my students just don't get the social construction of reality, but all of the major conflicts on the planet today are differing social constructs in conflict with each other, whether they're religious or political or uh, whatever. So that's my piece. I think we have a, a profoundly important opportunity here, but we need to begin to tie these various strings together so that it makes coherent sense in facing the multiple challenges uh, ahead of us. Thank you.